All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the Scorpion Podcast. Today I'm joined by the illustrious academic, scholar, a professor of political scientist, science, and author of books such as War and Human, Human Civilization, Nations, and most recently, Ideological Fixation. That is as our guest. So if you'd like to introduce yourself to the podcast, then go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, I've already done so successfully. I'm Israeli. I'm based in uh, Tel Aviv. I'm a professor at Tel Aviv University. Uh, what else? Um, maybe just a description of your academic work. I mean, I know I already provided one briefly. So, so I've written so far, you know, just over ten books. Um, uh, some of them on the theory of on the cultural background of uh, military theory. Uh, from the Enlightenment, the 18th century Enlightenment to the present, uh, on on the causes and the evolution of war, that's war in human civilization, uh, on, uh, as you said, on uh, nations, that's uh, the contrary to uh, perceived opinion. I argue that nations are, have a long history and that they are deeply rooted in uh, human uh, consciousness uh, and as you said uh, the, among my uh, most recent books is ideological fixation from the stone age to today to today's culture wars um, in which uh, as uh, Bill Clinton said in response to the book this is the main problem of our times mm -hmm. absolutely yes well said now how I'll begin is whenever I you know interview any um, or even talk to any academic, artist, creative, just any interesting person. I'm always curious, actually, I'm immediately interested in learning a, perhaps a little bit about their personal background, um, their upbringing, if there were any formative experiences that impacted their intellectual tra intellectual trajectory, um, any, any just sparks or any moments that uh, perhaps influenced you to go in the direction that you would pursue later on in life or if there's any personal significance to, for example, the topics that you actually detail in your research, um, you know, such as war, nationalism, ideology. Um, would you say that, uh, would you say that there were factors in your personal life uh, that actually influenced you to pursue this path? Or was it more purely um, clinical, academic, detached? Um, if you'd just like to describe, in a sense, your background, perhaps, actually, you know, your intellectual journey, your background, your influences, how you got to the place that you are today. I know it's a very general open-ended question, but please feel free to go into as much detail as, as you'd like. So, so I, I was born and raised in uh, Israel. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> obviously, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, we have, I, I was eight when uh when the six day war took place in 67 and it was about that time that i acquired reading and i uh, haven't seized seen uh, seized ever since that is from second grade i was already you know well immersed in the subject of war uh reading uh, much too much uh, throughout my childhood on on this subject so uh when I reached adulthood, it was uh, just, you know, just a continuation of the things that I've uh, that I've been doing uh, since childhood. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. So, was, um, so you think perhaps growing up in Israel also may have influenced this? Just hearing about these wars and conflicts all the time, I mean, you mentioned the Six Day War, but I know I think about maybe six years afterwards, there was the, the October War, correct? This war in 73, and then more and more conflicts on and on, and then you had the Lebanon war and the conflict in South Lebanon. Do you think perhaps also um, just growing up in this very militaristic environment where you would hear about war all the time from family members on the news and the media, do you think that also perhaps influenced um, your trajectory in essence? So, as I said, undoubtedly. I don't know. I may have you know, developed uh, an interest in war in any case, but obviously uh, things that uh, happened in Israel, as you said, the wars of '67 and '73, when I was a child and then adolescent, uh, then uh, were you know were, were a very powerful trigger. Mm -hmm. Yes, and when you say that, um, you you read much uh, too much as a child. It's that's actually something I can relate to in a sense because I 
I have somewhat of a similar, I'm obviously far younger than you, but when I was eight years old, I actually found the biography of Saddam Hussein <laughs> and um, I just picked it up and I read it and I was absolutely fascinated and engrossed in that book. And so I left it out here, um, I think at a friend's house and I left it out in the open and and my my parents' friend said, oh, who, who's, who's this? who's reading your, uh, this book? Is it your husband? Because she was talking to my mother. And, and then they said, oh, no, it's actually your eight-year-old son. <laughs> and, um, so I, I, would, I wouldn't want to compete with you, but, but when I was in third grade, I was reading with great fascination uh, Theodore Mommsen's uh, History of War, on, on, on which he, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Wow. But, yeah, so yeah, I was already well <laughs> inside. <laughs> I can relate to that in, in a sense, right? So on that note, then um, I'd like to actually to segue into because I want to see how you interconnect this to war. But uh, as far as I'm aware, this this common thread that weaves its way through your works on many different topics, from war to nationalism to ideology, is actually evolutionary psychology and sociobiology and the insights that are taken from those fields. And that's something that's interesting to me because not it doesn't seem like many political scientists are, are very keen to apply insights from those fields um, to their areas of expertise or in their research, even though it's obviously very significant. And in regards to nations, specifically that book and your theories of nationalism. So you assert that nationalism actually is a pre-modern phenomena, but that it has pre-modern roots and specifically as if I'm correct on this, that it has roots in kin culture communities and these evolutionary incentives that developed because an individual would share the um, greatest percentage of common DNA or genetic material with the members of their kin culture group. And thus they had an incentive to preserve and perpetuate the kin culture group. So to demonstrate an affinity towards the members of the group to ensure the, the propagation of their genes from generation to generation, which is, as, as we know from evolutionary biology, is really the goal of life in a sense, if there is any biological goal. But would you say that this logic can actually be applied to, for example, themes such as war, um, ideology, even, even terrorism? When I was reading the book Nations, I thought, I um I recall that many of the of the terrorist and insurgent groups in recent history have actually been of an ethno-national character, as, as I'm sure you were, from the PKK, um, which is this Kurdish faction in Turkey, to the Tamil Tigers. And uh, a tactic that they often used was suicide bombs, right? Um, it's asymmetrical warfare. I think the Tamil Tigers actually popularized this. And I thought, well, perhaps this is a bit of a stretch, but maybe there's this innate logic there of um, a sacrifice for the members of one's kin culture because that sacrifice in terms of evolutionary logic could actually bear out to be quite fruitful if it ensures the survival of the group so what do you think about these interconnections and and how um what would you say about the importance of um, evolutionary drives in terms of explaining human behavior more broadly so please go into as much detail as you'd like so, so you have, you've touched on so many, you know, topics that uh, you will need to cut them, uh, you know, into pieces. But, but let's start with the, with the essentials. And this is uh, there was uh, the dominant during the 20th century the notion of uh, human beings as a clean slate, tabula rasa. Uh, that you can, uh, you know, they know this uh, view is uh, has a long history, but it has uh, it, uh, dominated the social sciences during the 20th century, partly as a reaction against the uh, social Darwinism of the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, now, uh, now. Uh, most of the criticism leveled against the clean slate uh, already in the 18th century apply. Obviously, we uh, we take a lot from our environment, but uh, but we have uh, deep grooves in our mind uh, around which uh, the our essential uh, essential impressions from the outside uh, world are. And it's it's clear that this is so. I mean, we uh, we evolved. Uh, basically, there were two uh, fundamental views of how we got to be what we are. One is uh, divine creation. Uh, 
uh, that's no longer as, uh, as as convincing or as persuasive as it used to be. The other, you know, suggested by Darwin in the 19th century was uh, evolution. And uh, nothing about nature, to quote uh, some famous quote, uh, makes sense without evolution. Uh, you'll need to explain how this uh, incredibly complex uh, machinery that is uh, organism uh, that organisms are and especially you know the, the humans and the human uh, mind how they came to be yes. uh, and and evolution is the only uh, principle that we have to explain it if uh, uh, and then everything that we know about the biological record uh, supports this so uh, much of the social sciences have not yet, uh, and, and humanities, have not yet adjusted yes, not, to, not the, to the idea. So for them, everything is learned, everything is, uh, you know, uh, not so. Uh, so you need to ask, obviously, environment and social learning are, are, are huge, and we'll talk about this later. But there is also our natural propensities, which obviously take a different expression in in uh, in, you know, in connection with uh, changing uh, with diverse uh, social conditions and natural conditions. But these propensities are very strongly curved in our mind and in our you know uh, mental and physical machinery. Everything that uh, we are. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm not, you know, I don't regard myself as a typical uh, generic uh, social uh, political scientist. And, and you know, I, I break, I try to break disciplinary walls uh, throughout the social sciences and the humanities, history, archaeology, uh, you name it, evolutionary theory, uh, and try, uh, try to see um, and it, it, you know, to, to apply this to various major questions. As you said, war, nationalism, ideology have been some of the subjects that I've worked on. Mm -hmm. Now, how would you say these evolutionary drives um, influence or manifest in terms of ethnic um, affinity? Ethnic so you have, already, you, have, you have already touched on, uh, on, on yes. the great deal. Of this. So, so during the 20th century, the, the second half of the 20th century, it has become uh, fashionable, partly, partly in reaction against uh, the horrendous manifestation of nationalism uh, culminating with uh, Nazism and uh, all the other horrors of national wars. It has become uh, fashionable among social scientists and historians to regard uh, nationalism as uh, something modern, uh, some uh, dated to the uh, French Revolution, some uh, to the process of industrialization, some to um, some to the to print uh, technology, uh, to regard this as something modern. Uh, and uh, and uh, all and also something superficial, uh, something that uh, that you know was um, was um, invented by political elites for their purposes, and uh, uh, they, they, they uh, imposed or, or, or you know propagated to the masses by means of. Uh, by means of the educational system and other things. Uh, and I think this is entirely wrong. Uh, the, the peoples have existed from the beginning of time. Uh, you know, people, uh, you know, sometimes people are so, uh, you know, talk about nationalism and they, uh, they mention the, uh, the atavistic notion of tribalism. Now, this needs a much more serious uh, examination than just evoking this uh, to explain something that is unexplainable when they see there's such a uh, fierce eruption of nationalism. So tribalism is often mentioned. So human organization from the beginning of our species, Homo sapiens, has, uh, was uh, based around tribal organization. 
which, as you said, is, is, uh, is above all a kin culture community. That is, the people of a tribe are uh, genetically related, they intermarry they, uh, within themselves, they are also a cultural community sharing above all uh, language and uh, much else in terms of uh, you know, symbolic and material culture. And, uh, and when states emerged uh, and a tribal organization gave way to, uh, as I said, to state organization, uh, the same strong affinities remain. Now, now not all states are, uh, are national states and not all states uh, include, uh, are built around one single uh, ethno genetic uh, biogenetic uh, um, cultural genetic uh, group but they tend to be based around them uh, obviously with uh, various uh, you know uh, qualification that maybe we'll pursue in the uh, later on I see so then if, if that's the case that um, these innate pre-modern evolutionary processes that are primordial, you could say, underlie, for example, ethnic nationalism, how would you contrast that with civic nationalism? Because, you know, to me, it seems like civic nationalism is, is something, if anything, that is actually more likely to be caught a tool of elites, of political elites, because it's it allows for this, this homogenizing process where you can gather a wide array of different ethnicities, different culture groups, different nations that hail different religions even, and subsume them under the banner of loyalty to the civic institutions, like the constitution, the juridical process, etc. If anything, that actually seems to me to be much more of an instrumentalist tool, you could say. And it's generally associated, I think, with contemporary Western liberal democracies, uh, especially U the US and France, where I think many people would even claim that it originated actually in those two countries, the US and France. Um, and it's and it's seen, I think, as a as a less pernicious or perhaps a more up-to-date per perhaps version of nationalism uh, compared to ethnic nationalism, nationalism, which I think many elites and many people in the West today perhaps view as somewhat backwards, tri tribalistic in a sense. But do you, do you, I know you touch on this, I think at the end of the book and Alexander Jakobson, your partner, he, he, write, he wrote a lot about this at the end of the book. What do you see as the key delineation between the two? And which one do you think will prove is proves to be a more potent factor? Because many people think that the age of nationalism is, is essentially over. They think we're just being subsumed into these liberal institutions. You know, these types of old differences won't really matter as much in the future. What what do you see though in terms of the, the difference? So uh, so many have already noticed that this uh, accepted uh, the distinction is a, fa a false dichotomy. Basically, what civic nationalism means is that all members of your community are regarded as part of the nation. Uh, but all civic uh, civic nation, and you mentioned some of them, will uh, will. Uh, We'll examine them in a minute. All of them rests on a shared, first of all, a shared culture and a, a shared sense of uh, uh, the, the of uh, of uh, community. We'll see in a minute. So take France, for example. You know the quintessential uh, civic community. Uh, it was only created. Uh, the French nation, and it insists to this day that the only language of France is French. And everybody who wants to join the, uh, the, the French nation needs to be, uh, needs to uh, speak this, uh, the uh, French language. Now, I don't need to remind you that Fran Fra French was the language of the area around Paris, that France was divided into many languages and, uh, and uh, dialects, very diverse uh, in that regard. And, and it was uh, only by the coercion 
and of course also by the charm or the coercion of the French state, the charm of French uh, uh, culture that uh, gradually the, the process was called, you know, peasants turned into Frenchmen, gradually uh, the people of France uh, became French speakers. The process uh, only uh, ended by at the beginning of the 20th century. Okay, so French culture and the French language, there was a process of cultural homogenization of France. Now, this is not civic. I mean, not in the, the, the superficial sense that people believe uh, that uh, civ of what civic means. Uh, so the French, uh, the French, the French state insist on cultural homogeneity more than uh, most other countries. It does not allow any other. It does not allow any other identity within France. All right, it's the opposite of multiculturalism, France. Now let's take the United States which is less coercive in this regard, but still the process is the same. And that is people who come to the United States or have come to the United States of a century have become uh, integrated. I don't want uh, that uh, integrated into what is known as American culture. Above all, uh, leaving behind the native uh, languages, which uh, survived for one or two generations and adopting English. And then taking on <laughs> all that is known as American folk uh, culture, from you know, from baseball to football to the, everything else, to Hollywood to everything else. Mm -hmm. So obviously, this has been a fusion uh, culture. Obviously, each of the immigrant community brought its own uh, its own uh, contribution, and obviously, there is still a lot of diversity in American culture, partly because uh, waves of immigrants continue to arrive as, as they have uh, throughout uh, along throughout these centuries but the process has always been and i uh, dare say would, will continue to be that they are being uh, integrated into what is known as uh, american uh, culture uh, some groups are less uh, you know, some groups stand out in being less uh, integrated into this culture, but all in all, this is the picture. And people deceive themselves by saying that American uh, national identity uh, that, that is based on uh, the uh, on the loyalty to the constitution and then to the country, and that's it. No, it's not. It's not. It, ba it is based on a common, uh, on, take Canada, for example, yes. which would be, you know, which would be a counter example. Canada is no less liberal than the United States. But in Canada, you have at least two ethnic groups. Uh, the one is uh, French speaking, the other is English speaking. The one that is English speaking, the C process is not, not unsimilar to what you see in the United States. That is people immigrants come from all over the world and, you know, adopt the, the, a new language, uh, or the, you know, live behind the, and so forth. But French culture, a uh, French community being deeply invested in its own culture, make uh, Canada at least a binational state uh, with, with, uh, with uh, ongoing tensions that might, you know, could have uh, led to secession and might still uh, lead to secession. Mm -hmm. So, so you have here three civic nations, all of them based on uh, common uh, cultural. And, and I remind take France, for example, the United States is an immigrant country, but take France. You remember the uh, revolutionary uh, uh, slogan. Uh, the, the, one of them is fraternité. Yes. That is, we are all brothers. There is a strong sense in all nations of being uh, of being related. In immigrant countries, less so. Culture play common culture plays a, a greater role. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. No, no, very, very well said. So, in that sense, you would say that even the term civic nationalism itself is somewhat of a misleading term, then. 
you think? It is. The, the, uh, it's a false dichotomy. That is uh, civic versus... There is a difference. The difference is that civic nations regard all the citizens as belonging to the nation. Sometimes this would lead to greater coercion. Uh, some ethnic nations uh, would regard, say, take Germany until uh, recently. Uh, they would regard naturally only, you know, only all time Germans as really belonging to the nations and all the rest, the rest as minorities. They might be citizens, but they do not belong to the German nation. Mm -hmm. Now, Germany would not enforce on them, even though some, you know, some processes of cultural uh, integration do take place. But but they were never they were never regarded as true German. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not the case that civic nationalism is more tolerant. It's not. In many cases, it's more oppressive. France is the, the quintessential example. Yes, because it requires more of an assimilatory process. So that has to be forced, right? That's it. That's essentially the case. I see. So with that being said, then, this is also a very broad question, but how would you describe the state of nationalism in the world today? Because, as we know, with any with any phenomena, with any human phenomena, you know, there are peaks and valleys, and there are convulsions and maybe some downturns. But would you say that there are any particular hot spots in, in the world today, perhaps of ethno-national sentiment? Would you say that it's been on the decline, that it's been on the ascent? I mean, how do you view the the nationalist map in a sense. So, so we know that there are two processes that run in parallel, and there is nothing. Uh, and people try sometimes may exaggerate one or the other. There is a process of greater integration. By the way, now uh, in some places of the world, they are going into reverse, uh, well, then, which is uh, we, which include not only, uh, of course, economic independence, but in terms of the. Uh, of uh, you know a, a, the common culture if you you know you go to all countries people are more or less dressed the same with uh, jeans and you know and so forth and they listen to pretty much the same uh, music and uh, have the same uh, the movie stars and watch uh, ma many of the television uh, so, so there is a diffusion also of a common culture uh, common uh, symbols, common values, but at the same time, there is also partly as a reaction to this uh, development. There is also, um, there is also uh, sometimes affirmation of local identities, affirmation of uh, local uh, set of values and cultures which are seen as being threatened. Some of these expressions are more militant than uh, others. Uh, uh, most notably, the reaction of uh, of uh, some in the Islamic world to what they see as uh, sub subversive uh, effect of uh, Western liberal values on their core beliefs and core values. But you see uh, even more dangerous uh, expression in both China and, and Russia. Uh, both affirm what they regard as their own uh, historical and cultural traditions against what they see as a corrupt and degenerate uh, Western uh, liberalism. So these uh, these uh, two processes uh, run parallel, uh, and I assume that uh, in the foreseeable future they will continue to do so as with ups and downs, uh, as you said. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, um, I had some some specific cases. I, you touched on at least one of them briefly, but some specific cases that I had in mind where ethnic nationalist sentiments still seems to be quite strong are actually Canada in the case of Quebec, and also Turkey um, in the case of the of the of the conflict with the Kurds that are mostly in the southeast of the country. I mean, if you'd like to expand perhaps on those two cases. So so let's expand even more. Let's take the most liberal countries in the West, really with countries with impeccable, uh, you know, uh, qualifications. So we already mentioned Canada, which can uh, break up any time. I mean, if there is a majority in uh, Quebec that ever decides to do so, they will break up. 
probably. Uh, in, uh, in Britain, there is a very, uh, a very strong uh, um, potential of Scotland, uh, Scotland uh, breaking away from the UK, even though the two, you know, the two nations have been united since uh, 1600, or if you wish, 1700. And the Scots were, well, you know, for very long, uh, a most successful junior partner in this uh, relationship. It benefited a lot. Uh, if you take Belgium, the two peoples there, the, the Valens and the Flemings, they, they simply cannot stand each other. And had they known how to divide Brussels, they would have uh, they would have divided divided the country long ago. They simply now handle their affairs as if they were two entities. Uh, and then if you want to go further, the, take Spain. Uh, we already saw the events in Catalonia, and also, of course, for decades, uh, Basque country. So these are the uh, most liberal countries in the world, and this does not prevent. Uh, the sense of national identity uh, from uh, posing a real challenge and a real threat to their uh, unity. Could you, could you perhaps comment on maybe the case of Turkey? The, the so Turkey, <laughs> Turkey is interesting. Uh, no, I, I said that you know it, it was uh, it was even more interesting to discuss the most liberal countries yes. to show how. Oh uh, yeah, but Turkey, Turkey. You see, the the thing with Turkey is that it's it proclaims to be a civic nation. That is, it regards all its people as belonging to the Turkish nation. Now, the implication from this, as was the case uh, for uh, for France for many centuries, uh, applied less rigorously over the past uh, generation or two. The, the implication for this is that you cannot you cannot be a separate or a distinct eth ethnic uh, community within Turkey. So the Kurds cannot be Kurds; they are. Turks, uh, and they cannot enjoy the right to, uh, say, go to school and uh, learn and study in their own language. Uh, they cannot get any recognition of their separate identity by the Turkish state. Okay, so again, we see the paradox of uh, civic nationalism. Civic nationalism does not necessarily mean tolerance. It's of, it often means the opposite. Yes, yeah. assimilation essentially, that's, that's what it implies. Then. An effort an effort to assimilate uh, the, 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 and, in, uh, and using as its instruments all, uh, all powers of the state, including uh, including the educational system. So ultimately, then you 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 don't see nationalism and ethnic ethnic affinity more broadly as a phenomenon that's on the decline. You you, you think it's here to stay for for, for quite. A uh, it's here to stay. Nothing is eternal, so I, I wouldn't want to. Uh, it's here to stay. You see it uh, re-emerging, and you know I don't have to you know to uh, mention Brexit. Britain leaving what was regarded hailed just uh, two decades ago as uh, you know as a United States of Europe replacing the individual uh, individual uh, national uh, states. This this not this uh, has not happened. I don't think it's going to happen. If you want the differences between Europe and the United, none of these countries is going to. Uh, forsake its uh, its language, its culture, its uh, sense of identity, itself of uh, of uh, solidarity within itself. So the, while the Euro the European Union is a very uh, important and uh, beneficial uh, body in many respects, the uh, the pretense that it can replace entirely replace. Uh, the national states of Europe was an illusion that has been exposed by events. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Um, 
Actually, if, if you see the Zoom meeting is about to time out soon. So what we should do now is um, just leave this call and then join the second link that I sent. Okay. You. That the, the second that you said sent me. All right. Recording and then.